Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 11. And what I'd ask, I'm going to ask um, Ron to do, I mentioned this, or just turn off the, the uh, or go back to our, our welcome slide. These are slides for the second sermon. And I want to preach to you this morning from Luke chapter 11 instead. And again, if you're new with us, there should be a pew Bible there somewhere. Maybe you can ask someone, look around you, look lost, and someone will help you find a Bible. Find Luke 11 with us, and I'd like you to see these words and understand this passage. I'm going to read to you, follow along as I read to you, Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. And I'm going to stop uh, as we go through and just point some things out, just sort of give you the ground. This last week I had a chance to visit a, a state park, and I always like to go to the visitor center first and get a map. So you have some idea of what you're looking for, what you're looking at, where you're going. That's what we're going to do right here. We're going to get the map of this text, and then we're going to break it down. Luke chapter 11, follow along as I read out loud. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Can you see this picture? Jesus goes apart somewhere, and he's praying. He, singular, he's praying. What are the disciples doing? They're all standing around. Oh, there he is, praying again. When Jesus is done praying, they say, hey, why don't you teach us to pray? You know, that is the need of our day, is people who pray. Amen. Not people who talk about prayer. Not people who preach Amen. about prayer. Not people who think about prayer. Not people who read about prayer. People who get on their knees and they pray. And you say, I don't know how to pray. Well, that's what the disciples said. We don't know how to pray. So they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And this is what he taught. Verse 2, he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, that's the Lord's model prayer. It's a great prayer. We're not going to focus there today. I want you to notice what he says next. He doesn't even stop. There's no extra question. He just goes on, and he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend? And you're going to him at midnight. Now, stop right there. Which of you has a friend and you would go to him at midnight? <laughs> Please do not come to my house at midnight. <laughs> Unless there's a death. I mean, somebody's bleeding. I mean, it's got to be serious to go at midnight, right? So what does this guy want at midnight? And say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. Okay, stop right there. Do not come to my house for bread at midnight. <laughs> what I'm wondering as I read this passage is, what in the world does this have to do with prayer? What in the, where is Jesus going with this? First he tells him how to pray, and then he says, okay, now imagine you have a friend, and he comes to you at midnight, and he says, hey, I need bread. What would you say to that friend? I know what I would say. I've had people knock on my door at midnight before in Mongolia. Go to the door. It must be an emergency, right? What do you want? I want to talk. Is anyone dying? No. I'm bored. I want to come back tomorrow. I am not talking with you at midnight. True story. He was drunk, too. But that's another reason. Verse 6, for a friend of mine, he gives an exp explanation. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. This is a key to understanding why Jesus brought this parable out. I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give, give you. Here's Jesus, I, Jesus, say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity. Now that word importunity means to keep asking. Because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as much as he needed. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now those two verses are pretty common. A lot of Christians have a good idea of, of those what those verses mean. But look, look at the next verse. If a son, this is verse 11, shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, 
will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he, for a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? He just drew that to him. I told you the story about the guy with no bread. I told you about asking, seeking, knocking. And I'm telling you, if you're a father, you don't give your kid bad stuff when he asks for good. And if that's true, here's the key. How much more would your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask it? Father, we come to you this morning because we, we, don't, we don't have. We're like that man who goes to his cupboard and he has nothing. And we're so grateful that you are a good heavenly Father. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The circumstances you've allowed in our lives this week, they're because you're building in us the character of Jesus Christ. So we thank you for those circumstances. The people that have disappointed us this week, the ones who've shot an arrow through our heart, maybe not even intentionally, but it hurts. We thank you for those people who pushed us back into your arms. And there's been comfort there. We thank you for the comfort you give to us. The failures that we've had, the temptations we've given into, we thank you for the forgiveness that is in Christ Jesus. We come to you this morning, we've worshipped you in our song, we've sung sincerely, set my soul of fire. We sung, tell me the story of Jesus. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King. We're thankful for those reminders of your goodness. We're thankful for those reminders of our need for you. We come to these words that you've inspired and preserved, translated for us. We know their your message to us. Open our eyes to see truth. Make our hearts burn within us because we've met with you. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, I want you to understand, I'll give you the, the thesis right here. Our, I want you to understand our desperate need for the Holy Spirit. Our desperate need for the Holy Spirit. Prayer is good. Don't misunderstand. But when we pray, are we just praying for stuff? Are we just praying for help? And we're missing that we have a Heavenly Father who will give us the Holy Spirit if we ask it. You say, well, you know, Pastor, I, I've done that before. I've asked for the Holy Spirit. It didn't seem to work for me. That's why it tells us a story about the man who has importunity, who keeps asking. Because, yeah, sometimes we go to God, we bring him our requests, we think they're spiritual requests, we're speaking to him from our soul, we're speaking to him from our heart, and it doesn't happen. And we have an adversary, the devil. He's as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And he comes alongside and says, see, prayer doesn't work. You don't need to pray for that. We get tired, we get weary in our flesh, and we say, you know, I, I prayed for that a long time, I just, I've... I'm asking you, examine your requests, and where your requests line up with God's will, keep praying. Be that man of importunity. Keep knocking on your friend's door. Because we don't have a God that when we ask for bread, he gives us a stone. When we ask for fish, he gives us a snake. When we ask for, for meat, he gives us a scorpion. He, an egg, he gives us a scorpion. He's not a God like that. But we need the Holy Spirit to flow through us. Now, I, I use that verb flow for a reason. Because when you became a Christian, you got as much of the Holy Spirit as you're ever going to have. It's not that we need more of the Holy Spirit. Because it's not, you have 100% of the Holy Spirit. You don't get parts. But we do need to let him flow through us. Why is the Dead Sea a Dead Sea? There's no fish in the Dead Sea. There's no life in the Dead Sea. Oh. 
Yeah, the salt. All that runoff comes into the lake. All that runoff brings salt into the lake, builds up the salt level. Nothing can survive there. There's no outlet for the, for that sea, the Dead Sea, for that salty water to flow out and be, be replaced with fresh water. And if you just keep the Holy Spirit inside you and you don't let him flow through you, you are not going to be an effective Christian. We need the Holy Spirit to flow through us. Jesus said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Amen. We don't want to be just, well, frankly, we don't want to be a dam that keeps all that fresh water in. We want to be a channel that points that fresh water, the Holy Spirit, at the people in our lives, at the circumstances in our lives. Let me ask you to just think about the last time you prayed, the last couple times you prayed. This week, of course, each day I've taken time to pray. During the day, things come up. I'm praying about them. Think about your own prayers. What do you typically ask for when you pray? What is it that you want God to do? What is it that you want to God to give you? Because Jesus knew when he told his disciples, okay, here's how you pray. He knew what their focus was going to be. Give us this day our daily bread. bread. Why? Because bread's obvious. You either have it or you don't. But Jesus says it's so much more than that. Now, I've seen this week God provide for me. And praise the Lord. That's, isn't God good? He provides. Amen. But I want us to step beyond that and ask for God to give us our daily bread and to give us more, to give us the Holy Spirit. Now, not give us the Holy Spirit because he was holding the Holy Spirit from us, but to give us the Holy Spirit so that he flows through us. So the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And Jesus gives them the model prayer. And then Jesus tells them the story about the guy who goes to his friend at midnight to ask for bread. Now, it'll help you if you can imagine with me moving from this country to Mongolia. Because in Mongolia, if you have an, a friend, a visitor, even a neighbor show up at your house, it doesn't matter what time of day it is, you are expected to make them a meal. And I can remember talking with our Mongolian friends. They'll have someone traveling all day, show up at their house at 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning. And if you were to travel a long distance to get to my house at 1 or 2 in the morning, we would show you where your bed is. We'd make sure the bedding was changed before you got there. We'd show you where the towels are. We'd give you a glass of water, and we'd go to bed. We'd expect you to go to bed, not Mongolia. No matter what time you show up, they're going to make you a meal. There's also a second thing about Mongolia. There are no 24-hour supermarkets in Mongolia. Now, maybe some of you have been to Winco in the middle of the night. The lights are on. The doors are unlocked. You can go in, and they will sell you stuff. There's nothing like that in Mongolia. The stores close often as early as 5 or 6, and after about 5 or 6 at night, there is no place to buy food. There's no 7-Elevens. Well, in the city, there'll be what they call tootsies, which are like, yeah. Okay, but you don't have to go very far out of the city, and I've been to many places in Mongolia. There's no place to buy food. So if you are desperate to feed your visitor in the middle of the night, and there's no stores open, what are you going to do? You're going to go to your neighbor, your friend. And you're going to say, hey, I've got unexpected guests. I've got unexpected visitors, and I need to feed them, and I don't have anything. Well, what do you got? And hopefully he has something he's going to give it for you. That's the, the same culture that Jesus is living in. These men, these disciples, understood immediately why the man would be there at midnight asking for bread. He's not being ridiculous. He, he li literally has nothing, and he's desperate to give his visitors something because that's what's culturally expected. And the only way he's going to do that is if he gets help from his friend. Now, I'll tell you, listen carefully, because I, I know this is going to sound harsh, but this is our biggest problem, most of us. This is our biggest problem. We think we have stuff in the cupboard for our neighbor. We think we got stuff in the cupboard for our friend. We're ready. Somebody comes to us and they're in need. We, we know. You know what they need? They need a self-help book. We'll give them Napoleon Hill. If you don't know who he is, don't even look it up. They don't need a self-help book. They don't need to go to the Crystal Cathedral and Robert Schuller. By the way, the Crystal Cathedral is now a Catholic building. Uh, but the, the point is, is they don't need self-help. 
What do they need? They need the Holy Spirit to flow through us to minister to them. Or people come to us. And we think what they need is Christian cliches. And I know probably any Christian cliche you know I've heard before. I grew up in church, right? God works all things together for good. That's a true statement, by the way. I don't want to diminish the statement, but that's often not what people need to hear. Not because it's not true, but because it doesn't apply to their situation. There's no context. There's no need. Just here, have a bucket of water. We throw it on them and walk away. Let me help you here. Imagine you go to your cabinet, okay? Your friend comes over, your, your visitor, I'm going to use the term visitor because your friend is the person you're going to ask for food. Your visitor comes over, you go to your cupboard, you open it up, and you find sawdust. Now, I don't know anyone who keeps sawdust in their cabinets, but just imagine with me, you find sawdust. Would you be crazy enough to offer your neighbor, your visitor, excuse me, your visitor sawdust? No, you wouldn't. You immediately recognize that sawdust is not what that person needs. Sawdust isn't even edible. So let's call the self-help, let's call that the sawdust. But now imagine you went to your cabinet, and in your cabinet you found cat food. Now, can people eat cat food? No. Yes. Uh, could it even be nourishing? I suppose. Uh, I know I've eaten cat food as a little boy, and I didn't die. In fact, it didn't taste all that bad. I would not offer my guests, my visitors, cat food if that's all I found in my cabinets. But often that's what Christian cliches have become, just cat food. Yeah, they're true. And sure, I, I suppose if they sit and they think about it and they're, they're open to the Holy Spirit, God will help them. But they don't need cat food. They need real food. They don't need you to just throw a statement at them and walk away. They need, your, they need the Holy Spirit to flow through you to them to minister. So we have the sawdust of self-help and the cat food of Christian cliches. Some of us try the cardboard of human philosophy. Now again, you can't eat cardboard. It, it's, it's physically possible to put it in your mouth and chew it up and it just, just sort of disintegrates and you can swallow it and it will pass through your system. But don't eat cardboard. That has no nutritional value. And I was talking just this week with my dad about how often you can read a human philosopher. And, you know, humanly speaking, to my mind, there's logic there. There's reason there. But because they left God out of it, they have started with the wrong premises. And they have the right logic, but they come to the wrong conclusion. And if you want to give your friend the cardboard of human philosophy, you, you do that. It's not going to help them. It's not. Can they eat it? Yeah, they, they can chew it. It'll, you know, they won't die. Some of us want to give people rocks. And I, I'm, I'm being a little silly here. We want to give them rocks. You know, you can give people emotional music that will solve their problems temporarily. You can, you can sort of paste over their problems, and, and, and for a while, they'll forget about their problems. But it's like giving them rocks. That music, that just emotional music is not going to help them. In uh, Mongolia, when we were there, when we were in Mongolia, there came a scandal where the Chinese companies were selling milk that had been tainted with melamine. Now, if you know anything about chemicals, you know humans should not be ingesting melamine. You say, what would cause a company to put melamine in the milk? Well, what they were trying to do is that Chinese companies were taking milk. By the way, this, I'm not against Chinese people, but this is a little story. In 2008, 2009, you look it up. Chinese companies were taking milk, and they were adding water. Why would you add water to milk? Well, because you can stretch it out. You take a, 10 gallons of milk, and you add 2 gallons of water, and yeah, it's watery milk, but now you can sell 12 gallons of milk. So the Chinese government, to protect its people, said, we're going to test milk, and the easiest way to make sure it's 100% milk is we'll test the protein content of milk. Well, some enterprising person figured out if you add mel melamine, it'll fake the protein test. It'll pass the protein test. The only problem is melamine kills people if they drink it in large quantities. And so there was this scare in Mongolia, Christy remembers, where people were saying, don't buy milk if it comes from China. 
Now, as far as I know, none of that tainted milk had been sent to Mongolia, but that was, that was the story. You know, we can feed our friends cardboard, rocks, and even cat food and sawdust, but it's not going to help them. If you're going to help your friend, here's number one lesson. You have to realize you have nothing. You have nothing in your own strength. Now, I know this goes completely counter to whatever you're hearing in the world. The world tells you you can do it, you, you, you can train your mind, you can do it. What did Jesus say in John 15, 5? Without me, you can only do so much. No, he doesn't say that. Without me, you can do a little bit, but I can help you be better. No, no. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Now, it isn't because God hates us that he tells us this. Isn't God trying to beat us up, you know, bang on us? And, You're such a... No, 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 no. God realizes when we compare my abilities, my wisdom, my strength, my emotional... What do they call it? EQ, emotional quotient, right? When we compare that to who God is, there is no comparison. Amen. There is no comparison. So why am I trying to minister to my neighbor, to my visitor? Why am I trying to minister to my visitor with my own ability? Why don't I just open my cupboards, realize, yep, sawdust, cardboard, rocks. I have nothing to offer my visitor. Close my cupboard and go to God and say, God, I need the Holy Spirit. I need your help. I need your wisdom. I need your strength. I need your comfort. My, my, my visitor is hurting. They're, they're emotionally damaged. I don't want to give them Christian cliches without the Holy Spirit. I, I don't want to give them a verse without the Holy Spirit. I don't want to, certainly don't want to give them human philosophy. I don't want to give them the best I can do. I need something from you. And you say, well, what if God doesn't answer the request? Where else are you going to go? That's the whole point of this. He says, I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. The door is shut. I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. I am not getting up to help you. And what does his neighbor do? I'm going to be here until you give me something. Well, go away. It's going to be a long time. I'm going to ask. I did that. I'm going to seek and I'm going to knock. Because I'm desperate. Now, God is not desperate. And God doesn't want us to be desperate because God is some sadist. God wants us to realize how we have nothing. And when we come to him, he'll give it to us freely. And if you don't get it the first time, and I, I say the first, uh, let me not say it. If it doesn't seem to you like you're getting it, just keep going back to him. Just keep going, because where else are you going to go? Seriously, you want a self-help book? Trust me, that's not going to help. You want some Christian cliches? Yeah, I can give you a bunch of Christian cliches. You want the Holy Spirit? I can't do that for you. Only God can do that. But what I can do is I can go to God. I can get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can flow through me. I already have the Holy Spirit when I'm saved. I know that. But the Holy Spirit can flow through me, and he can minister to you. But it starts when I go to my cupboard and I say, I don't have anything. Now, there's a second illustration that Jesus gives here that doesn't really make a lot of sense at first. And that is, he says in verse 11, if your son asks bread, do you give him a stone? If, the, your, if your son asks for something that he needs that's helpful to him, are you going to give him something that's worthless, that doesn't help him? Of course not. If he asks for a fish, now fish are sort of scaly, right? Slimy. Are you going to give him a snake? Snakes are sort of scaly and slimy. Yeah, but a fish is good. You can eat a fish. Well, you can't eat snake. Yes, I know. I know. But the point is, a snake is dangerous. I'm not going to give him that. If he asks you for an egg, are you going to give him a scorpion? Of course not. That's dangerous. Let me take it one step further, and, and I'm extrapolating here. But what if your son asks you for something that's dangerous? Are you going to give it to him? If your son says, you know what I want? I want one of those marine knives. 14 inch blade, super sharp, for my fifth birthday. Are you going to say, yeah, it's about time my son learns how to kill people? Of course not. 
often when we ask God for something just to waste it on our own lusts and our own desires, James tells us God says no. Because he loves me way too much. Way too much to give me something that he knows is a good thing. So maybe I need, maybe when I come to God over and over and over and I keep getting the answer no, 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 maybe what I need to do is change my request. Instead of asking more for this, I need to ask more for the Holy Spirit. Because it says right here, if you're evil and you'll give your son what he needs, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? Now I want to be clear what I'm talking about when, when Jesus is teaching his disciples here that the, God the Father will give the Holy Spirit. When you become a Christian, you get all of the Holy Spirit you're ever going to have. In fact, the Bible uses this term. It says that you are baptized into the Spirit. Baptism is where you submerse something. When you put something completely under the water, we talk about water baptism. But when you're baptized in the Spirit, that means the Spirit is all around you. You can't get any more surrounded by the Spirit. The Bible also says that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. At salvation, he dwells within us. So you might be saying, well, so he's talking about salvation. No, he's not. But let me stop here and make it very clear to you. If you keep coming to empty cupboards and you're, what you're trying to give people is not helping them, or if you keep having your heart pierced through by many arrows and you can't find comfort and help, if you're lost and confused and walking around in a, in a blackness and you don't know what to do, let me tell you the first thing to do. Come to Jesus. Amen. That is not a Christian cliche. God has the answers. Amen. And he'll give you help. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you strength. But you do have to ask. And I'll be frank, I've been there, you've been there. What are you saying? Like, oh, God, I've got this. <laughs> Stop saying that. Quit coming to your cupboard and finding sawdust and saying, well, this is what I got. I'll try my best. Don't try your best. Go to God and say, I need, I need the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. yep. If any of you lack wisdom, James tells us, yep. let him ask of God. Before you go to a book, ask of God. Before you go to a podcast, ask of God. Before you go to your friend, your neighbor, before you come to me, ask of God. Amen. Then come to me, and let's talk. But God has the answers. Amen. And so many times when you come to me, you know what I'm doing? I'm praying. God, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> if you don't give me some wisdom, I, I don't know what I'm going to tell my friend. I don't know what I'm going to tell my Christian sister, my Christian brother. And if I've ever said anything to you, and it's been just right on, and you're like, boy, that's exactly what I needed, I can tell you, it didn't come out of my cupboard. I went to my neighbor I went to my friend I went to my heavenly father and I said I've got to have some help here and God is good so when it comes to this Holy Spirit it starts by becoming a child of God because everyone that is a child of God has the spirit of God and to become a child of God you first have to admit your own sinfulness and your inability to please God in any way your inability to keep God's law. He says things like, honor your father and mother, and I don't do it. He says things like, don't steal. You say, do you steal? Well, I haven't for a while, but I, yeah, there's been times in my life I've taken something that didn't belong to me and kept it. Don't lie. You say, do you lie? I work really hard. But in the power of the Holy Ghost, again, I, I don't think I've told any lies recently. But I remember when I was a boy, thinking this is going to be my ticket out of trouble. By the way, it never was a ticket out of trouble. We break God's law. We break God's law every day. And if I had to somehow give you some plan for keeping God's law, being righteous before God in your own strength, I, I look through the Bible. There isn't any way to do it. In fact, God's law exists to condemn us, to show us that we're guilty. So you say, well, what am I going to do? That's where you come to Jesus. Because the Bible also tells us that Jesus Christ, when he died, he bore my sin on his body when he died. He died in my place. But he didn't stay dead. Here's the good news. He rose again. 
Amen. Somebody said to me recently, or I saw this quote recently, they said, uh, if you go to hell, it'll be over Jesus' dead body. Well, that's, that's a nice saying. It's quaint. But it's wrong because Jesus is not dead. He's alive. Amen. And if you, if anyone here today were to go to hell and spend eternity separated from God, it would be because you walked right past a risen Jesus who said, come unto me. Amen. I will give you rest. Believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that God has raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says. You don't have to struggle on your own strength. You don't have to try harder. You have to come to Jesus, admitting your need for him. That's where it starts. But if you're a child of God, and I believe most of you, maybe all of you, you're already children of God, then you have all of the Holy Spirit that you'll ever need. Let me point something out to you in verse 13 again. The second half of that, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? That word the there is an article. And it's it's necessary in the English language because if we said, uh, how much more shall your heavenly Father give Holy Spirit? We'd say, you don't give Holy Spirit. There's one Holy Spirit, so you give the Holy Spirit. It's a good translation. But in the Greek, and you can check this on your own, in the Greek there's no article there. Because the Greek has a different way of using articles than English does. In the Greek, when there's an article, it's referring to a specific instance or a specific person, the Holy Spirit. When there's no article, it's referring to the quality or the essence of something. English does not do this, but this is how Greek does it. But we, we do, actually we do this in a different, slightly different way. Let me illustrate it this way. And I'm borrowing this illustration from someone else. If I talk about the love that I have for my country. You recognize that's a specific instance, right? Oh, you know, Scott, he loves his country. That's great. The love I have for my country. If I just talk about love, it could mean almost anything as far as you could love your country, you can love your wife, you can love pasta, right? But there's some essence, there's some quality that we call love. Now, Greek doesn't work quite the same way, but the emphasis, by leaving out the article, the emphasis is not on the Holy Spirit as a person. The emphasis is on the Holy Spirit as his qualities or as his essence. And you might say to me, well, pastor, okay, what is the essence? What is the quality of the Holy Spirit? Well, we know what it is. Because God tells us the fruit of the Spirit, the essence of the Spirit, the quality of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now, as I looked at this, and this is why I got so excited about this message. As I looked at that, I said, that's what I need today. Boy, life comes at you. One of you has illustrated this way. It's like you're in a boxing ring. And sometimes you're giving more licks than you're taking, right? You've got your, your guard up, and your, your, your enemy's dropping his guard, and you're just giving the, the, the left, uh, left uh, hook and, and, and the right jab, and it's going great. And other times it feels like you're the one getting beat up. It feels like the enemy's getting all the hits in, and you're not getting any licks in. I don't care what it feels like. I'm telling you, if you go to Heavenly Father and say, I need the qualities of the Holy Ghost. I need love. I need joy. I need peace. I need long-suffering. I need gentleness. I need goodness. I need faith. I need meekness. I need tenderness. God is not going to say to you, well, you're going to have to come back tomorrow. Because I'm all out of Holy Ghost today. <laughs> no. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more yeah. does the Heavenly Father know how to give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? Amen. That's why I said, what are you asking God for in your prayer request? Because if what you're asking for is, you know, uh, I need a, a new bumper for my car. God can give you a new bumper for your car. Don't miss that. But what you really need is long-suffering, don't you? Because you might not be getting that new bumper for a while. <laughs> you have a neighbor, not talking about the neighbor here, but you have a neighbor who annoys you. You have a coworker that annoys you. You know what you want to pray? You want to pray, God, just strike him down. <laughs> just lay it up. Think about James and John, right? 
Jesus and his disciples, they come to a city in Samaria. And the Samaritans say, you're not welcome to stay here. You guys are Jews. You're not welcome to stay here. And what is James and John's solution? Let's call down fire. Let's burn these guys up. They don't know who they're talking to. Jesus says, you don't know what Samaria is. The Holy Spirit doesn't help me get my way. The Holy Spirit helps me get God's way. Amen. The Holy Spirit doesn't help me get what I want. The Holy Spirit helps me get what God wants. And those can be very different. You struggle with anger? I know I do. You say, I never see you get angry? I hope not. Because when I get angry, it's not because the Holy Spirit's leading me to get angry. It's because I'm giving in to my flesh. Because when I ask my Heavenly Father for the Holy Spirit, He gives me all the peace and all the gentleness that I need. You say, well, you probably, you come from one of those families, you know, type B personalities. Everyone's pretty calm, cool, and collected. I do not. My wife will tell you. You get me and my brother together, and it's loud. You get three of us together. It's pandemonium. We used to literally make my daughters, when they were one, two, three, four years old, they would start crying because it would get so loud and so stuff. That I, my wife would say, if you guys don't settle down, I've got to take these children out of the room. We weren't angry. We weren't yelling. We were just loud. So you can imagine when we do get angry. You can imagine when I'm mad. The Holy Spirit doesn't call me to anger. The Holy Spirit calls me to peace. Gentleness. You say, well, Pastor, I need more of that. I'll tell you where to get it. You're going to go to God. <laughs> You're going to say, hey, God, you see this big problem that keeps making me mad? See this person over here? They just irritate me to no end. If you put a be angry button right on my chest, that person would push it and push it and push it. and I'm sick of it. And he says, if you're an evil father and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father Amen. know to give the Holy Ghost? You know that acts? Why don't you ask for some more peace? Why don't you ask for some love for that person that keeps pushing your buttons? We talked last week about loving your neighbor. And I know some of you, two weeks ago when I was here, last time I was here, we talked about loving your neighbor. I know some of you thought, you don't know my neighbor. I'll tell you what, you don't understand my God. Amen. Because he can give you love for the unlovely. And I tell you what, people are getting really unlovely. Really unlovely. Ugly. Mean-spirited. And you say, and we have to put up with that? Yes, that's what Jesus calls us to. Amen. To follow in his steps. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. But you're going to need the Holy Ghost. You have bitterness in your life? Do you feel that injustice coming to the surface every time you think of that person or every time you have to be around that person? Because they mistreated you, they've been unjust towards you, and that bitterness is just festering. You need to realize your cupboards are bare. I don't have a book for that. I mean, I have books, but I'll tell you what the answer is. You're going to go to the Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father, and you're going to say, hey, I have a visitor. He showed up at midnight, and I need something to give me. And God's going to give you victory over your bitterness. Are you impulsive? Are, are you impulsive? I, I was recently talking to someone out of state, and they were trying to help me minister to a third party. And that person out of state said, uh, that person <laughs> is really impulsive. And I've been around that person for several months, and I guess what I realized, they're really impulsive. Are you impulsive? Do you just do things on a whim and then later think, that was so stupid. Why did I ever think that was going to work? It seemed good at the time. You know what you need? You need more of the Holy Ghost because he's temperance. He's self-control. His ability to say no to sin so that you can say yes to God. But here's our biggest problem. I said it earlier. I'm going to say it one more time. Biggest problem, I've said two more times. Our biggest problem is we go to our cupboard and we say, I got it. I've got some sawdust, I've got some cardboard, I've got some rocks, I've got some sand, I've got some cat food. Cat food's edible, right? And we minister to ourselves and we minister to other people with things like that. And then we say, I don't know why Christianity doesn't work. 
Christianity is not a religion that's a list of rules to follow. It's a relationship with a God in heaven who becomes your heavenly father. When you ask him for the Holy Spirit, he gives it to you. Now, I, I tell you why I don't ask for the Holy Spirit, because I don't like to walk in the Spirit. I like to walk in the flesh. You like to walk in the flesh. You like to say, hey, I have a right to get angry. Do you know how many times this has happened? That's what we like. I have a right to be bitter. Do you know what they did to me? I have a right to be impulsive. That's what we always tell ourselves. We've got to go to our cupboard, saying it appears the last time. We've got to go to our cupboard and say, I have nothing. That's where it starts. That's what drives me to prayer. You tell me your request, and I think, how am I? I can't, I didn't know, I don't even know how to pray. And you know what Romans 8 says? When we don't know how to pray, we've got a Holy Spirit who prays for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. That's what Romans 8 tells us. Amen. You say, I'd like some of that. You can have it, it's a gift. You don't have to give to this church. You don't have to come here. It has nothing to do with Elmira Baptist Church. It has everything to do with the God in heaven. But that's why we love Elmira Baptist Church, because when we come here, we get to worship that God. Amen. We get to talk about, do you know what he did for me this last week? you got to hear this story. You don't need more of the Holy Spirit. You need to realize your need for the Holy Spirit. You don't need to go to God. If you're a child of God, don't go to God and ask for the Holy Spirit as in, I don't have him and I need him. Ask for the Holy Spirit as in, I've got all I need. I've just got to let it flow through me. I've got all I need. I just There's some blockage here. Would you show me the blockage? And I'll tell you what, so many times God says, I'll tell you what the blockage is. I'm, I'll give you a real life example of something that's happened in the past that I'm not thinking of the specific instance. But more than one time God said, I'll tell you what the problem is. You're mad at your wife. I said, yeah, but you know what you did? As long as I say that, I'm not going to get more of the Holy Spirit. Right. He's here. He's living inside me. I've been submerged in him, but I'm, I'm going to stand for my rights as a husband. I get to rule the house, and my wife, I tell you, that's never gone anywhere with God. This is where it's gone. God, you're right. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm going to go to my wife right now. I'm going to ask her to forgive me for being a jerk. And an idiot. But I need your Holy Spirit to be long suffering, to be gentle, to have me at peace. That's always worked. Amen. That's right. You don't need more of the Holy Spirit. You, you need to realize your need for the Holy Spirit more. You say, Well, how am I going to recognize when? How am I going to recognize when I am in this position where I go to my cabinet? Nothing's there. I go to God. I say, God, give me the Holy Spirit, and the Lord gives me the Holy Spirit. How am I going to recognize that? What's that going to look like? I'll tell you what it's going to look like. You're going to find all kinds of people to whom to minister. You're going to be like that Samaritan who's just headed down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and one day there's a guy beaten and bloody on the side of the road. And he didn't say, Why? I wish I could call 911. No, he went over and he ministered to that. He put that man on his own donkey. He took the man to the nearest inn, the nearest place where there was safety and comfort, and he paid his own money for that man to be treated. Let me ask you, you remember the story. Who had, just previous to the Good Samaritan coming along, who had walked by that bruised and bloody man? A priest, a priest and a Levite. They were too busy serving God. As a Christian, you'll know that you've gone to your cupboard, Found it empty, and you've gone to God and asked for the Holy Spirit. Just give me the Holy Spirit, because all of a sudden you'll see that person needs the Holy Spirit. They need the ministry of the Word. They need they need my empathy. They need my love. And I'm going to go over there. I'm going to minister to them. And that guy at work that's an irritation, he's still going to irritate you. I, I'm just going to be kidding. He's still going to irritate you. But you know what you're going to realize? He's irritating me because he's a dirt, dirty, rotten sinner, just like I am. And if I don't respond to him in the Holy Spirit, we're just going to always be buttonheads. So I'm going to respond to him in the Holy Spirit. It's not that the injustice that's done, that has been done to you, is going to disappear. You're just going to realize how much injustice did I do to Jesus when my sins hung him on the cross? Don't really have room to complain anymore. And the Holy Spirit's going to minister peace. Amen. 
Holy Spirit Spirit's going to give you gentleness and goodness. And he's going to flow out of you like rivers of living water. Amen. That's what Elvira Baptist Church needs. is a prayer life that finds a way to open the windows of heaven and become a channel for the Holy Spirit. You can go to a lot of churches and they're going to tell you, hey, I'll tell you how to get rich. You don't need money. Trust me, you need the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can go to churches and they'll say, well, I'll tell you how to get your health back. I want you to be healthy, but healthy or sick, chronic illness or no, strong or weak, old or young, you need the Holy Spirit. You can go to churches and you'll leave feeling so pumped up, you'll feel like somebody put a shot of adrenaline right in your arm. But on Monday morning, you're going to have a hangover. There you go. Because you don't need an emotional high. You need the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, Look at the scripture with me again. Open your Bible. Luke 11, verse 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Take this verse to the Lord. When you go to prayer later today or tomorrow, you go to prayer before the Lord. Take this verse. Take 11, 13. Say, I claim this verse. You are faithful to your promises, and I need the Holy Spirit. Don't be surprised if if the Lord comes back with, okay, let me tell you what you need to confess first. Yep. Because often it's my sin that's hindering the Holy Spirit's work in my life. Don't be surprised. Just confess. Say, you're right, Lord. <laughs> I've been that way. Yep, that one too. Yep, forgive me for that. Because what you need, more than anything else, more than money, more than health, more than strength, more than wisdom, you need the Holy Spirit. I am convinced, I am utterly, absolutely convinced, there's no doubt in my mind that if a majority of us in this room could grab a sense that we need the Holy Spirit, we get on our knees and we, we beg God, not for stuff, not to complete the building, that, that'll come, not to fix our kids, yeah, my kids need fixed too, but we beg for the Holy Spirit, for love, and joy, and peace long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance, if we could get a hold of that, this church would be completely different. You say, I sort of like the church the way it is. I do too. It's a great church. But as a pastor, I know we can do better. Amen. Amen. But I'll tell you who else needs that. Our community needs that. There are broken, desperate, lost, confused people starting as soon as you leave this door. All the way to the Bay Area. There are people who are running headlong after their own selfishness and not finding any satisfaction, no happiness, and they're going to blame you. And you know what you need? You need the Holy Ghost, the qualities of the Holy Ghost, to respond to them. Father, you have to take the truth of your word. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them to ask? You have to take the truth of your word and drive it home to my heart. Drive it home to my listeners' hearts. I can speak for a majority of us. We want to see our church transformed by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. We want to see our church take another step forward for you. It's, it's a good church, and I thank you for the love and the sweetness that is here already, for the friendly spirit you've given us. But it's not the lovely that we're struggling with. It's the uh, unlovely, the ugly ones, the ones at work that are persecuting us because we are Christians. It's the neighbor who's just so outlandishly selfish that nothing we do or say can satisfy him. It's that uh, family member that's just, they've got a reprobate mind and nothing they say even makes sense, but they insist that we're wrong. Father, it's those people we need Holy Spirit qualities to respond to them. It's the impulses of my own flesh pulling me first toward evil and wickedness and then over to stupidity and idiocy. Father, I need temperance to say no to sin and say yes to you. It's the broken people in our community 
they're going to go to self-help group after self-help group and they're not going to find help. And they're going to try books and they're going to try podcasts and they're going to try uh, uh, therapy. And they simply need a Christian out of whose bellies flow rivers of living water. Not to minister the cat food of Christian cliches, but the bread that is Jesus Christ to them. The water that is the Holy Spirit, that living water. Father, I bring this to you because I have nothing. I'm so grateful for your word and for your Holy Spirit that empowers, directs, gives wisdom even this week, giving me wisdom to respond. It's because we love you and we want to see you exalted in our community that we come to you and we ask that you would drive home this point that we need to be channel for the Holy Spirit. He needs to flow out of us. Remove the hindrances. Remove the weights. Remove the blockages. Father, give Elmira Baptist Church an opportunity to turn Elmira upside down, and Vacaville upside down, and Dixon upside down, and Deerfield upside down. We pray these things because, again, we love you. We want to see you exalted in our society. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.